just having a uh, little bit of a cat fight here. So, um, yeah, you have to have a bit of amusement. Uh, no animals were harmed in the uh, filming of this video. So, and uh, what I'm going to talk about here in this video is Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so in as a in in homage for our Australian friends, and, and the hat is being worn correctly. Last time I tucked this inside, and I had comments from people in Australia saying, "You got to let this thing sort of hang down." They were wondering where it was. It wasn't an authentic um, Australian hat with uh, without this this thing hanging down. So Shackleton and I are going to discuss the extreme weather events and the climate havoc that has been going on in the uh, southern hemisphere. Most of you are aware of these heat waves that we've been getting in Australia, you know, in big cities, massive heat waves. So, you know, we often mostly when we talk about climate, we talk about the northern hemisphere. We talk about the warming Arctic, Arctic temperature amplification um, and uh, how the jet streams are slowing down and becoming wavier but again it's it's northern hemisphere centric so there's a number of people including some of the 0.1 percent and one percent that think that the southern hemisphere will mostly be immune or somehow more resilient or protected from the ravages of abrupt climate change and nothing could be further from the truth really and i think australia is getting a bad wake-up call because Temperatures are reaching such high levels and with high humidity in parts of Australia. You know, not so much high humidity. That's more near the coastlines, um, near bodies of water. But temperatures have been getting so warm and there's been, you know, everybody relies on air conditioning for survival and, you know, crops are affected. The flora and fauna is being devastated. Bats are dropping out of the sky dead. Insects pummeled. Um, even things like the koala and kangaroos are suffering severely, you know, icons of Australia. We also know about the ocean temperatures off Australia and the bleaching and dying of many of the coral reefs, many parts of the Great Barrier Reef, um, which is a huge boon to Australia's tourism industry. So I'm going to talk about, um, you know, people are aware of those things. I'm going to talk, uh, you know, about areas, things that people aren't so aware of. So recently it's the um, Tasmania, the southern island of Australia, has been um, experiencing uh, a fairly new phenomena called dry lightning. So lightning's occurring without rainfall. So, and this is setting all these wildfires, um, you know, which are burning now every year in and some in regions that have never had wildfires pristine forests um you know endemic species of pine trees etc that are that are mostly found only in this region and uh, they're being devastated by these wildfires i'm also going to talk about some of the heat waves that have been occurring in uh, on on in in argentina on the southern tip of argentina you know, actual heat waves in areas that haven't had heat waves before. In fact, it got so hot that all the government buildings shut down and everybody just went to the beach, basically. You know, uh, really strange um, warm weather in this region. Also, the Atacama Desert, the driest desert in the world, has undergone torrential rains and flooding. There's even been a waterfall formed in that region. Um, this is in, uh, you know, inland um, in uh, South America, in uh, Chile, actually. So the Southern Hemisphere is by no means immune from these effects. Um, the jet stream, the, the, the greatly warming Arctic means that the heat, there's less heat to be transferred from the equator up, in, up north in the atmosphere and in the ocean currents because the north, the Arctic is warming by itself um, because it's much, much darker. Um, and I mean, it's also getting lots of feedback warming from the warped and wavy jet streams, etc. but it's a darker place and it's therefore absorbing a lot more solar energy. So there's more heat going from the equator down into the Southern hemisphere and we're seeing it um, disrupting, you know, changing the patterns of 
weather causing heat waves in places like Australia and South America, and also changing the nature of the ocean currents and the, and the um, jet streams in the Southern Hemisphere, which is having you know, huge impacts also in Antarctica. So let me get to some of the details um, of what's happening there right now. Okay, so um, this is my uh, th this is my my Twitter at Paul H Beckwith. So um, I just tweeted. I just want to point out uh, the key point of the the video I posted earlier tonight. Global average temperature rising about three times faster over land than water. Um, this is not um, yeah. So this is the this is the uh, key image here, and what you see is. Um, you know, 1.6, people have compared 1.6 to 0.8 and said the warming is double over the land, but you've got to get the slope. So the slope of this is 0 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade. That's the slope of this line. Slope of this line for the ocean, uh, the linear fit to the ocean temperature is 0, uh, is, is 0 0.10 Celsius per decade. So 0.27 over 0.1 is 2.7. Okay, so the land, the slope, the land is actually warming 2.7 times faster than the ocean, and that's since 1975. Okay, so that was uh, the last video. Now, a friend of mine, um, Matthew, posted a lot of stuff and messaged me about the Atacama Desert and about um, the gateway to Antarctica. So I've been investigating that a bit more carefully and uh, we're getting huge, crazy things happening. So like I said, the Atacama Desert is, um, it's the driest place on earth. Parts of it are now flooded. It's, high, it's a high altitude desert. The high altitude contributes also to the, to the dryness. It's in Northern Chile. So where is it? Okay, so uh, I go to Google Earth and just do a search, go over here, do a search for Atacama Desert, and here we are. Um, okay, it's in this region here. Um, see this little knob here? It's just inland there, or you can get, you know, if you put the pointer here, you'll notice at the bottom, the latitude, longitude, you know, where the, where the arrow is. So 23 degrees, 51 minutes, north uh, 69 degrees eight minutes west okay so you can get the latitude and then we go into uh, you know earth uh, null school and I can and put move this pointer around and look at total precipitable water or total cloud water um, in the air at the surface and I can move the pointer around until the lat long or roughly um, the location that we see in Google Earth Okay, so then we get the location of the Atacama Desert. So heavy showers at high altitudes, dry river beds filled with water, became rushing torrents of water, um, left over 1,200 homeless. Okay, and there's videos of the disruption. And this one here I'll show you. This is a waterfall. This is a big waterfall in Val de Quisma. I can't pronounce it, Pica Matilla, northern Chile. Okay, an actual waterfall appearing in the desert from the huge amounts of rain. Remember that desert sands, you know, they're not used to water. The, um, so the ground can get hard packed, you know, it can get as hard as rock basically. So there's very little infiltration of water in it. So any water runs overland, you get lots of overland flooding. So this is a river overflowing in San Pedro de Atacama, flooding the streets and buildings. I'll just play this briefly. Okay, so... Okay, so basically the water is not... is, is not... You know, basically the water is, is, is not... Um, infiltrating it's just overland flooding in the Atacama Desert okay moving um, elsewhere on in South America let's go to the the tip of Argentina Rio Grande a city in Argentina 
Um, population of 67,000. This is where we are. Again, you can just go here and type Rio Grande, Argentina, and then zero into it in Google Earth. So this is where we are. Okay, so what happened here? Um, let me just... Uh, so here we, we have heat waves. Okay, a heat wave. This is called the Gateway to the Antarctic. Unusually warm temperatures in Argentina's Tierra del Fuego province, gateway to the Antarctic. On Tuesday, uh, February 5th, officials declared a holiday and people all went to the shores, to the beaches for recreation. 87 degrees, it says it reached here, Fahrenheit. That's 1,400 miles south of Buenos Aires. People change their habits, like they don't obviously have air conditioning. Um, so very unusual activities for these latitudes are sunbathing, swimming along the coast, and uh, even though the water is still very cold, you know, the structures aren't built for warm weather, no air conditioning, so they couldn't really work. The average, summer average, of course it's summer in the southern hemisphere, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So here they say that 87, they actually reached a temperature of 91 Fahrenheit. Okay, so um, some people swimming in the Beagle Canal this week. So very unusually warm weather in this region. Okay, down here. And uh, let's have a look at uh, what else happened. Okay, so the dry lightning in Tasmania. So Tasmania, uh, here's Tasmania. Okay, this is the island of Tasmania here. Okay, and what's been happening in Tasmania is um, there's been um, there's been dry lightning. Okay, so what dry lightning is is basically you get a storm. You know, you get uh, you get you can have a cold front. Whether cold front coming through drives up the warm moist air, it starts to rain like a normal thunderstorm, but it's so dry and so warm at the ground, the rain actually evaporates before it reaches the ground. The lightning still happens from the storm, so the lightning hits dry vegetation and sparks all these uh, bushfires. So these environments are very dry, the fuel's full of fuel, vegetation ready to, bo to burn. Now these cold fronts usually carry rain right and uh you know rain out so the lightning you know the lightning lots of storms and lightning are are are, are normal there but they hit the lightning hits wet ground nothing happens so now with the dry lightning it's hitting the it's hitting the dry uh vegetation setting it on fire causing these large intense fires frequent fi large intense fires were rare but now they're being fought almost every year and uh, there's also regions uh where um, there's also regions where there's wilderness world heritage areas where they basically, they're not used to fire. There's old growth forests like Mount Anne, home to some of the world's largest kingbilly pines, a species endemic. So it's only found in Tasmania. And, uh, these, um, you know, it's always been damp out during fires. So there's no risk of bushfires, but that's no longer the case. So now there's now there's fires, and these fires are hitting endemic species, including pencil pine, huon pine, deciduous beech, as well as this king billy pine. Okay, so uh, it turns out that a lot of these rain-producing storms, low-pressure systems, are moving south of Tasmania. They used to hit Tasmania, but now they go south, leaving the island drier. Okay, so we're getting area, we're getting fires happening in areas where there's never been fires before. And the fact the, 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 the forests are very old growth, very, uh, her, you know, heritage forests. But now the storms are happening without rain reaching the ground. It evaporates before it reaches the ground and the lightning, you know, thousands of lightning strikes. And in fact, um, uh, on January 15th alone, over 2,000 lightning strikes sparked more than 60 bushfires. So this is the new world for Tasmania. And of course, in Earth Null School, you know, you can cycle through the dates and look at the rain coming to the driest areas in the Atacama. You can look at the temperatures in, in uh, 